So did any of you notice two weeks ago I preached the same message? Yes, I preached yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm, a couple weeks ago. Oh. Yeah, I preached the exact same message I preached the time before. But it was totally different. I mean, there were parts of it that were the same. It was so funny because Michael, he came up and said, you know, uh, people were responding, and I remember it was five words, he said, you know, it's like something you never preached before, and I said, well, actually, you know, I preached it last week. Well, and, uh, sometimes you may have the same message, but people listen in a different way. Right. Well, exactly. and you know what was interesting is um, my Mac crashed, and so I had studied on the identity um, course, and I had all my notes in there, and I even saved them to a Word document. And I guess when the computer crashed, uh, it erased everything uh, that I had studied. And so I had to go back and restudy that section. And uh, it was like I saw it through different eyes. It went in a totally different direction. So the Word of God is multifaceted for sure. Um, just so you guys know, Mary Alice's hours were changed, and so were Bob's, so they will not be at the furnace on Fridays. Um, hopefully she can uh, keep coming on Sundays, but in case y'all you know wonder after a couple weeks, where's Mary Alice Bob? That's what's happened. So I didn't tell you guys. Um, I'm really irritated that my iPad is not working properly. We're going to start in Second Peter one four, and we're still discussing uh, doubt and unbelief, um, and we're going to uh, finish the. Uh, thing that I've done twice now, we're actually to the different section of it, okay? And when I learned this, guys, it really began to, okay, let me start over. The promises of God are often taken as um, benefits that you get, uh, blessings, people take them as blessings, but the promises of God are actually the way we share in the nature of Jesus Christ. So they're like the doorway. They're not just blessings in our lives. They are meant to confirm that we are believers. And uh, like, for example, uh, in Deuteronomy, it says that God gives you the ability to gain wealth. A lot of people stop there. But it also says in order to confirm his covenant. And so God displays proof, so to speak, of us being born again believers with his nature by the promises we are accessing uh, in our lives. So don't view them just as blessings or gifts anymore, but view them as the ability to be as Jesus Christ was on the earth, okay? And so he gives us a picture here, Peter does, of how we do that. And I'm not going to go through the whole well, I might read the whole thing, but we're going to focus on uh, verse 4. But let's go ahead and start at um, verse 2, 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And so that tells me that grace and peace is multiplied in the knowledge of God. It's not multiplied outside of uh, knowledge of Him. It's not uh, multiplied by breathing techniques. Uh, you know, anything that you might do that's physical to bring peace, his peace is not as the world gives. It's, it's supernatural. And so is grace. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So again, the divine power has given us everything we need. There is nothing lacking whatsoever but it's through the knowledge of Him. So that means to the degree that you know Him, that is the degree you'll have grace and peace in your life. And it's also the degree that you will walk in His nature. So it'd be like um, if, if you don't understand that God loves you, every time you open your mouth, you bring Him pleasure. Uh, if you don't know that aspect about Him, then you'll come to prayer timid. But the Bible says that he's given us grace and the boldness to come to him in his throne room. And really, we're already there anyway, so it's kind of silly. The only time that you need to be concerned is if you are in outright rebellion and unbelief and you refuse to stop. Okay, when that's the case, you're no longer, you have no longer access to his presence until there's repentance, okay? And so then he says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great 
and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So exceedingly great and precious promises. Paul cannot make them any more fantastic. Paul was very dramatic in his writings. I mean, he would use, you know, these super abundant, over-the-top uh, words to, to emphasize to us what we've been given. So he says, you've been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you can share in the divine nature. And then he says in verse 5, for this very reason... Give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance or patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So right there he shows you the way to be fruitful in your walk is to know what the promises are, access them through getting to know who He is and who He is in you, and then adding the different characteristics to your uh, soul life, basically, in your thinking, so that you're not unfruitful. If you've met people that have been born again for years and years and years and are the same as when they were born again, then they have not added anything at all. So that's why they're unfruitful. And you have two types of people. You have people that uh, do not add anything and they stay in the same sinful state really as they were when they were born again. And then you have those that are pious or religious. They have an appearance of godliness, but they have no power. So uh, demonstrating the character of Jesus and kindness and compassion and wisdom and stuff like that does not occur because they're very much legalistic. So I just want you to know there's two types of people that are unfruitful. So if there is an area in your life that is barren, you're missing something. Okay, You're missing an, an aspect of Him or a knowledge that you need. And it's very important because uh, I think it's Hosea that says that uh, His people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Four, people six. stop there. 4-6? Yeah. Okay. It's actually knowledge of God. If you study that out, it's not just knowledge general. It's knowledge of God himself. And then it says, Gigi used to quote this one all the time, that the gates of hell are open wide uh, for the ignorant, isn't it? Is it Isaiah? Uh, for lack of knowledge, the gates of hell are opened wide for the lack of knowledge. And so knowledge of God and all you're getting, get that, is what Proverbs says. Um, so, but the, the main thing that I want you guys to see is that corruption came into the world through lust. Now, a lot of people think that lust is a, a sexual sin, but actually lust is a desire for anything forbidden. Okay? So, uh, Adam and Eve did not sin sexually and fall. They sinned because they desired the tree that God said don't have. And here's the way uh, lust works. It plants itself as a thief, a thief, as a seed in your thought, and then you begin to give that thing momentum, and it begins to form a picture. And then before you know it, the picture that you have in your heart is now taking action that leads to the sin which corrupts. Yes, Christy? Oh. Never asked a question before. So, like, what's an example, rather than, like, you know, the apple from, or the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat, you know? Mm -hmm. But, like, what's an example, like, for us, I guess? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. There's lots of examples. Um, let's pick a, a couple that maybe are, like, more of what we would call sins, and then we'll pick a couple that maybe you don't realize. Um, so, let's say, for example, if you're a covering drug addict. Um, you've been born again, you don't have any draw toward that, and all of a sudden you see a friend that you used to get stoned with or whatever, okay? Before you know it, images, thoughts will return, and you'll begin to see a picture of you using the drug and of you uh, hanging out with them and some of the things you used to do. And then the enemy will even come and say, you know, God doesn't mind, it's just one time, I mean, you know, 
That is not what forgiveness is for. And then before you know it, you got all these things occurring. One of the things that was so neat is when I first got born again, Gigi told me that old friends would come out of the woodwork and they would begin to call you and contact you to, to lead you back into the life that you left. I had people calling my phone that didn't even have my number. I don't know how they got it. And, uh, and so if I would have entertained the thought, I could have gone down that road and then I would have found myself back into that life. So that's an example. Another example is, and I, this, man, this was so good. Dr. Hartfish was talking about when God calls one spouse, he calls the other. And he said they might serve in different roles, uh, like your dad. <laughs> um, he is more one-on-one -on -one with people, and I'm more in front of uh, you know, several people. And so, but he said there's always a call together. God never calls one spouse and not the other. So he said what happens is if one spouse is not in agreement and the other is ministering, the enemy is always there to provide a like-minded spiritual friend to come alongside, usually of the opposite gender. And so they begin sharing a relationship of spiritual things is improper. Now, where does the thought come in? Well, the thought comes in where because it's out of order, one or the other can begin thinking thoughts of, you know, I married my spouse before I was saved. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be married uh, to this person anymore. They're obviously not in agreement. And then you start having thoughts of spending more time with this person, and your whole thought life is taken over, and before you know it, your heart is informing a picture of you being with that person, leaving your spouse, and committing adultery, and that's where you see a lot of ministers, their marriages fall apart. So those are two sin things. Now, another thing is, like, let's take maybe a spiritual exercise of uh, prayerlessness, okay? So what the enemy is, is prayerlessness is like the apple on the tree. And so what he'll do is he'll distract us He'll uh, create emergencies, or he'll lie to us and say, well, you don't know how to pray. When you pray, it's kind of boring and stuff, you know, and blah, blah. And so we create this picture of ourselves as not knowing what to do. Therefore, we just don't do it. Um, and then the prime example is when you have a body of people that get together, you're going to have tiffs and offenses and things. And so the enemy will begin to form a picture in your head of the other person due to offense that is incorrect. And so before you know it, offense has entered into the body and it will spread. Does that answer your question? Okay, so there's different ways. It's not just sin, as we call it. It can be relationship. You, you know? Are you, are you okay? Okay. Um, any other questions? <laughs> mm -hmm. An idol? Any kind of idol, even like uh, worship can be an idol. Um, like one of the things that has actually been hard for me that I have to really guard is my own personal time of worship. Because now I'm used to singing with Christine, I'm used to you guys. And so if I'm not careful, I'm, I have a really rough time worshiping on my own hmm. with music. And I did not expect that. So then I'm like, this is stupid. And so I spend like 15 minutes trying to find something that I can connect with. And so usually I'll just put it down real low and do my own, my own thing. But, but yeah, it can definitely be an idol. And a big one, I think, is ministry. Ministry becomes a huge idol. Um, people get an image in their head that they're only significant if they're ministering. And so before they know it, that's their identity instead of being a son or a daughter. So yeah, anything that's uh, idolatry, and of course in our world we don't have you know, straight up, you know, Buddha and things like that in America as much. It's getting more and more. Um, so those things corrupt. So anything that God has said is forbidden is considered uh, off limits, and if you begin to lust after it, um, you can fall into corruption. And the thing is, the first thing to do, if you fall to lust, confess it, and stop. Um, remember I told you guys that never once in the Bible does it say to ask for forgiveness? Do y'all remember me saying that? Mm -hmm. Well, in uh, James, and I always admire people that are able to just 
um, go to people and say, you know, I did this, and um, it was sin, and you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I love that because for a lot of people, that's really hard for them to do. Um, but it says in James 5, uh, let's read 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. I like that. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray for him, anointing, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now notice it was a prayer of faith. And that person being healed, the results of forgiveness. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And then it says in 16, confess your trespasses uh, to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I find that interesting that he's calling a man righteous that's needing to confess sin. And so, that's really important. Once you confess sin to the Lord, and once you confess sin to another, it's done. He's faithful and just to cleanse you of all sin. And I find a lot of people actually have unbelief when it comes to forgiveness. Okay? And so, the Israelites and the religious leaders of the Lord's day um, had dis deceitful influences in their heart. Remember, let's um, turn to Hebrew, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 3 and 4, where it says, uh, verse 12, chapter 3, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. So number one, an evil heart uh, of unbelief causes you to depart. And so people that are withdrawing from God, they are in unbelief somewhere. Okay, they're not exercising their faith and then it says but exhort one another daily why it is called to, uh, today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin and so that is very important because now once you mature in the Lord you recognize all sin is bad you know what I mean like you don't like you're not pulled like maybe when you're a baby Christian but the enemy will lie straight up to baby Christians uh, and immature and, and make them somehow believe that it's okay to do what they're doing. I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard the doctrine that weed was made by God so we can smoke it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's that stupid. was me when I first got saved. I was like, well, it says so in the Bible. So right. when we talk it while we were reading the Bible. Christian too that said that. Mm -hmm. that <laughs> no. He claimed to be Christian. This Christian guy said it's okay to smoke weed, you know, because God created it. Yeah. Oh and so, you know, here's an answer to that. Number one, uh, do you want to destroy your lungs? I mean, it's a temple of the Holy Ghost, so if you want to destroy your lungs, go ahead and destroy your lungs. But God says he'll destroy whoever destroys his temple. But the second thing is, if God says not to drink to act, uh, excess and you smoke a joint, you're instantly high. You lose control. You don't have any self-control over your thoughts and it leads to other sins. So uh, that's an example of a deceitfulness of sin. And then another thing is um, they could not enter his rest because of unbelief. That was verse 19. So what my point is, guys, is that the rest spoken of in Hebrews 3 and 4 represents your promised land. It's houses already built, crops already planted, okay? It's where everything has been done no more labor is required of you. The only assignment you have in the promised land is to strive to enter rest. Yeah. Okay, that's the, only prom that's the only thing that you need to do. But once you've arrived, then you need to maintain it. And the only way you will properly maintain your promised land is by continuing to stay in the nature of Jesus Christ. And that is continuing to stay in the promises of God. Because if you begin to get lax and you don't guard your heart properly, then what will happen is the enemy will come in and he'll introduce false doctrine or he'll introduce offense. Me and Mike were talking about the furnace. And I said, you know, <clears throat> I said, if the enemy hits in any way to try to destroy what God is birthing here, um, I don't feel it will be a straight up frontal attack. I feel what it will be is a very subtle, insidious, 
thing. Like it'll either be uh, pride or it'll be uh, someone that comes in and brings in false doctrine and some of the people believe it. Um, that happened to Claudel. And see, the thing is, is uh, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 1, it says, be of the same mind and say the same thing. And so our responsibility, me and Mike's, is to watch for the wolves. Because anyone that comes in saying something different from what the good news is saying, they will be confronted and removed. And so um, that is one of the ways to protect us. But uh, like Claudel said, uh, when he, he said, you know, I really feel that you guys are going to pray for me in Clovis. And I'm going to be healed. He told me that. And, uh, and he said, so are you guys ready? And I was like, Claudel? I mean, you know, the first peeps know. That God heals all the time. There's just no question, you know. I said, so I'll let them know. We'll be praying about it. And whenever you're ready, you just be prepared to put those crutches in the back of your car because you won't need them anymore. And he said, well, okay. And he was all excited, you know. And uh, he said, now, you know a miracle like that can draw attention. I said, I know. Because I don't want attention drawn. Because that brings up a whole new set of problems. So those are things that are very real and they're going to happen in the future that we have got to make sure that we have laid a solid biblical foundation on the Word of God, the Apostles' Doctrine, and nothing else, and that we have hearts that are humble and that know how to be in His presence. Because once things start happening, it can get pretty crazy, okay? Oh, and uh, I wanted to tell you guys, only... Um, that the next year's topic for the Reformation Center, are you ready? Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. It'll be all about the person of the Holy Spirit and how to work with Him and all that stuff. Because I really feel in my spirit that the Lord is saying He is the most neglected person of the Trinity and He has been suppressed in churches. He Amen. has been silenced in churches. And Paul said, do not... Um, what is it? Do not uh, quench the Holy Ghost. And that literally means subdue. Mm -hmm. And so it's like telling him, no, you can't do that. And that has happened so much. And so I felt like the Lord was saying, in order to have a kingdom apostolic culture, you guys have got to know how to work with Holy Spirit. And so we're going to really dig into that. But Hebrews um, 4, 1 through 2, let's go on with that. Now, I want you to notice that the reason, um, well, let's actually read Hebrews 3.18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. God connects unbelief with a refusal to obey him. Okay? So anytime there's disobedience, there's unbelief in his eyes. And then he says in 4 verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So that means you can listen to the word over and over and over. But if you're not actively combining what you're hearing with faith, it will profit you nothing. And so faith is what pleases God. It's pleased Him from the beginning. So we have to make sure that anything He tells us to do, we're mixing with faith. One of the things that um, amazes me about the Apostle Paul, the first word to him after he was knocked off his high horse, so to speak, was, you will go before Gentiles, kings, and Jews. And do you know that it happened in that exact order? He went to Gentiles and shook up the church because he was going to Gentiles which actually caused him to end up in jail when he went to Jerusalem. And then he appealed to Caesar after talking to two governors, and no one could convince him not to go to Jerusalem. He said, no, I have to, because God said, you'll go before kings. While he was in Rome, because he got shipped there once he appealed to Caesar, who was Nero, crazy dude, okay? Once he was in Rome, he was on house arrest for two years. Guess who he ministered to the most in Rome? Jews. So in Jerusalem, in Judea, he ministered to Gentiles. And then when he went to Rome, he ministered to Jews that believed in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so he did not allow 
any person to sway his course. So it's kind of important to know, guys, where you're going. What is your course? What has God shown you? Because everything that God has shown you, you will make decisions based on that. It says without prophetic vision, the people perish or cast off restraint. And so those that fail or disqualify themselves, they have no vision. They don't know why they're on earth. So can y'all answer that? Do y'all know why you're here? You do? Okay. Worship. There you go. That's like, that's like the base. You know what I mean? Like it's the foundation is to worship God. Okay? So allow that to influence all of your decisions. And then it says in verse 6, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again tying unbelief with disobedience, he designates a certain day saying, uh, David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart, hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Now, what is important is that the Jews rejected the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Rest. And so remember, Romans 9 is what we're talking about. Because they rejected that, they did not enter. Now, I want to show you something. Um... Entering his rest is not guaranteed for even us, as we've just read. But in uh, Romans 11, 16, well, actually, let's go to 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. In other words, God sent him to us, yet he tries to provoke his fellow countrymen, the Jews, to jealousy. For if their being cast away is a reconciling of the word, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, the root supports you. In other words, Israel, the Jewish person, that nation is our root system. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. The same danger that the Jews faced, we face. And I'm going to tell you, I see it. I see it in the American church. I see people that do not consider that they are standing by faith and they begin to enter into this whole work still and they begin to put people under works. You have to do this. This is the standard we have at this church. You know, blah, 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 blah. And they're literally preventing the people of God from entering the rest of God. And the same word that Jesus gave to the Pharisees applies to the modern day Pharisees. Yeah. And it's this. You cross land and sea to get one convert and make them twice the son of hell as you are. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You've got people going to churches that are told if they go to church and if they do this and do that, they'll go to heaven. They are not even born again because it's become this works situation. So we're repeating the same mistakes. But just like the Lord found those that had prepared the way for him, and just like uh, throughout history there's been always a sect of Jewish people that believed in the Lord, the same is true with us. So we're actually going to see, I believe, a, a replay by modern day Pharisees, Jew or Gentile, spoken of in Matthew 24, whose love has grown cold, uh -huh. who are offended, uh -huh. that begin to betray the truth, uh -huh. and they begin to attack those who are in love with him and believe him. Oh, yeah.
Okay, so we're going to see the same thing. So don't be surprised when that happens. 